Okay, I'm going to go over uh, some of the things about degenerative and a lot of the some of the principles that we need to see for uh, for um, sagittal balance, which really helps us understand uh, some of the reasons why things fail and, and uh, what we're looking for on an X-ray. These are the two hospitals I worked for in Toronto. We'll go over some of the alignment, uh, the compensatory mechanisms, some of the indications, and uh, some of the goals. So at the, at the start, you want to know what a deformity actually is and what is normal, and so. Basically, on the coronal plane, we're looking at a straight spine, and on the sagittal, there's a lot more confusion. Uh, there's cervical lordosis, there's thoracic kyphosis, and there's lumbar lordosis, and we'll go over some of the things that we want to look for. We generally try to get the scoliosis as close to zero as possible, uh, but for our objectives, really, we want a head that's centered over the pelvis with level shoulders and a level pelvis. Uh, as I said yesterday, this is really one of the key articles that really helps us understand what the normal anatomy is. And minus is lordosis and plus is kyphosis. And you can see this is the rough uh, distribution of the sagittal alignment that you want to have. And you can see that uh, in this, most of the lordosis is going to be between L4 and S1. So you can see that, it's, you know, some fi people find the numbers hard to remember, but you can see that the majority of our lordosis is between 4, 5 and 5, 1. Uh, you can see roughly at 12, 1, we're neutral, and we go up by about 5 degrees uh, each level to about 25 degrees for 5, 1. Our th uh, our, we have a very neutral thoracolumbar junction, and we have this gradual increasing kyphosis, most at the apex in our thoracic spine. And if you kind of know this, you'll know how to bend your rod appropriately and what your goals are. The other thing is everybody's lordosis is really dependent on their pelvic incidence, as we know, and we know the pelvic incidence, which is the... Uh, from the center of the 5-1 uh, disc to the pelvis, uh, to the hips, uh, is equal to our sacral slope and our pelvic tilt, and I'll go over some of the things we look for. If you want to look at rough normals, we're looking at a pelvic instance of about 52 for most people, uh, of which two-thirds of that is going to be in sacral slope. So the majority is sacral slope and just a little bit of it, a one-third in pelvic tilt. Interestingly, people with lytic spondylolisthesis, the numbers are much different, and we have much higher pelvic incidence on patients with lytic spondylolisthesis. Uh, with obviously changes in the sacral slope and, and uh, pelvic tilt to accommodate. But our goal is really to have a C7 plumb line that crosses through the 5-1 disc and a T1 tilt angle that goes from T1 to the pelvis running through the 5-1 disc, and that angle should be close to zero. So how, how do we make a balanced spine? So first thing you have to understand is the more pelvic incidence someone has, the more lordosis he's going to need and the more kyphosis he's going to be in order to find. So someone with a lower PI is going to have less of, a ch of, of these parameters. Um, Roosley classified them into four. He's, he's added a, a second one. So people with very low PI to people with very high PI, you can see the difference in the angle of the sacrum uh, from more vertical in these to more horizontal in these. And the needs for lordosis is going to be different depending on what your patient has. <coughs> But uh, generally, we're looking at a relationship of more PI means more lordosis, and more lordosis means more kyphosis. So how do we compensate? So people with very high pelvic incidence are going to have more range to compensate as opposed to people with low. And if you just look at your standing x-ray, you can see your sacrum is flat, and that means that they're compensating with uh, pelvic tilt because their sacral slope is low. So sacral slope plus pelvic tilt. So if sacral slope has gone down, that means your pelvic tilt has gone way up. And so that's kind of how we compensate. And when the spine's finished compensating, then we have to ask the legs, the hips and knees to help us. We look at three types of deformities mainly. People with thoracic kyphosis are going to compensate by hyperlordosing. People with thoracal lumbar kyphosis are going to hyperlordose their thoracic spine and hyperlordose their lumbar spine. You can see these by the open discs. And then people with lumbar kyphosis are going to lordose everything they can, uh, but then they're going to really have to bring their pelvis in because of the inability to compensate. So here's someone with a Sherman's kyphosis, and you can see the hyperlordosis. You fix the hyperlordosis, and you can see she doesn't need to compensate so much through the lumbar spine. Uh, someone with a congenital kyphosis at the thoracal lumbar junction, you see the hyperlordosis in the lumbar, hyperlordosis in the thoracic, fix the problem, the kyphosis comes back, in the, and the hyperlordosis goes away. So... Uh, fixing the primary problem, and then you can see someone with a lumbar kyphosis really trying very hard. He's recruiting all this hyperlordosis everywhere in his spine, bringing up his sacrum to zero and then bending his knees, and you can see when you fix him, his pants fall down and he stands up much nicer. This is a very interesting uh, case that I had because the uh, patient has a congenital anomaly, and you can see that all his spine is fused with a very, very uh, low sacral slope with a very high pelvic tilt. 
and you're concerned that with a spinal fuse like this, when you correct his osteotomy, you're actually going to bring him way back. Uh, but the truth of the matter, he's compensating so much with his pelvis that as you do your osteotomy and correct him, you can see that you've corrected the kyphosis and all you've gotten back was the pelvic compensation. So he was owed 30 degrees from his pelvis and he gave it back to you when you did the osteotomy. And so he doesn't need to compensate so much uh, through his pelvis anymore. And you can see he's standing uh, much more relaxed uh, with, in, in this manner. Um, these are lumbar lordosis cases that you can see, and you can see he's got about a 35 lumbar lordosis, which isn't really bad, and for stenosis and a slip at 3-4. But we've divided them up now into the lower arc and the upper arc, and you can see that his lower arc from L4 to S1 is almost zero. It's only five degrees when it should be two-thirds of his lumbar lordosis, and you can see he's opening up through his upper arc to try to compensate. And so this is not, this is a, a, a problem that he's, Normal upper arc would only have maybe 25 with 45 at the bottom, and you can see he's compensating through that. But if you look at his long x-ray, you can see this hypolardosis at the bottom is really making him compensate all the way up through his spine. So it's very important to appreciate that uh, giving the lordosis at the bottom is going to have a bigger impact. This is another example that uh, I heard a lot of cases that they did a lot of anterior approaches. But when they did the anterior approaches, they do the, take the discs out and then do an anterior compression. Anterior compression creates anterior kyphosis, and this kyphosis is very different. So we have 30 degrees of an area of kyphosis over an area that should be pretty neutral. So we've created 30 degrees of kyphosis, and you can see she's compensating mainly through her pelvic tilt, uh, which she wasn't happy about. And then I learned this is the reverse. Someone with a very uh, a congenital sacral anomaly with a very, very high pelvic incidence creating a hyperlordosis. And you look, her lordosis is pretty normal, but her PI is very high. And so for someone like this, what we uh, looked at doing was to decrease her pelvic incidence. This is a congenital anomaly, and you can see her very, very um, high pelvic incidence of uh, close to 90 degrees. And then what we did for her was a osteotomy through the sacrum to change her pelvic incidence. And you can see how much more comfortable she is standing up by having a realignment of the primary focus, which was the problem with a hyper uh, PI and a congenital sacral anomaly that we adjusted uh, through an osteotomy. So as we know, our surgical goals are to have an SVA that's balanced, a T1 tilt close to zero, pelvic tilt less than 25, and, and about a PI of 20, uh, less than 25. This is a, an article from 2007 from France with normal people, and it really is a very important to know. Uh, this is for normal young people, 150 patients, with different PIs. So you can see for a PI type 3, which would be our normal, we're looking at a PI average of 52 with 12 of pelvic tilt and 40 of sacral slope. And the lordosis was around 60 in these patients. But you can see that the lordosis increases for the increasing PI. And, and, but interestingly, the thoracic kyphosis stays about the same. So no matter what the PI was, the thoracic kyphosis was about the same. Um, and you can see that we have to tailor uh, the lordosis that we're trying to give based on the pelvic incident the patient has. This is a newer paper also that came out that's showing that age is very important, that patients need a higher PI minus lordosis ratio. So maybe in young patients, the lordosis may be even greater than PI, but as you get older, your goal should not be 10 degrees. It should be closer to 20 degrees on these older patients because otherwise they're going to be overcompensated. And we showed also if, uh, if we overcompensated patients with, uh, these are older patients in their 60s, and you can see with a PI of 52 and a lordosis of 35, we had a much higher complication rate on patients that were overcorrected. Whereas if we had a 15 degree difference, uh, we had a much lower uh, proximal gen gen um, junctional kyphosis ratio in our patients. And this was showed similarly by uh, Hanjo Kim did a similar study uh, showing similar findings. In the last few minutes, I'm just going to show some cases that show the theory. Uh, this is a cases that, that I did. And you can see that we fixed this patient for stenosis with a uh, fusion. And you can see we had no attention to his lordosis. And you can see what happened is he degenerated above and below. And as an answer, we extended his fusion without correcting his alignment. And you can see the same problem exists at other levels. So it's very important to take a step back and understand why they're failing and then what you're going to do about it. Here's a case that you can see that uh, a scoli, uh, some auto fusions through the spine with a very degenerative uh, sacral slope. And this one, we, we worked with uh, some Smith-Peterson osteotomies 
to try to restore her alignment. And you can see that we've given her, uh, gotten rid of her lumbar kyphosis, added some lordosis, and able to give her a more normal spine for her to stand up with. And this is, uh, we have three year follow up. This is a very interesting case that we had a 60 year old with uh, degenerative spondy and stenosis, and we did a fusion. Again, you can see uh, very little restoration of the lower arc lordosis. Uh, we have about 10 degrees of lordosis, and you can see how she opens up her discs in the upper ones to try to compensate with 40 degrees, and it didn't take long for the degeneration to start at the next level. Uh, of course, we added it on, and of course, we had the same problem at the other level because we really never addressed uh, the primary focus, which was the uh, lower arc uh, kyphosis that we did not restore in the first surgery. Um, here's a, a case that uh, the guy always complained of back pain. His MRI wasn't too impressive. And, uh, you know, I always examined him sitting down. And then I said, well, I'll, I'll just get an x-ray. And all of a sudden, you know, you can see that you really have to take a big focus on this patient's problem. is not his L3-4 stenosis, his global thoracal lumbar kyphosis, and a global uh, problem in his overall balance that can't be addressed with a single level uh, disease. Um, this is a paper uh, by uh, Silva and uh, Lenke, and I'll go over it briefly, just to give you a rundown of how to address uh, these, these patients. And you can see if they have claudication, back pain, osteophytes, listhesis, cob, kyphosis, they, just, they did a level of, uh, of treatment. So you look at all these factors, and then basically if they just have claudication, maybe you can just do a decompression. If they have decompression, with some back pain, maybe do a limited fusion. If they have a lumbar curve, uh, you should probably fix the curve. Um, and then they had considerations based on what they, uh, different pathologies and how, and so for someone who has global imbalance and lumbar kyphosis are going to need uh, fusion to the thoracic spine, probably with some osteotomies. And so this is a study where they tried to give you some guidance on how to manage. So there's controversies, when to fuse, when to you should go short, when to go long, when to do the front, different ways to go. And you can see that fusing short sometimes works, sometimes on sicker patients, that's your only option. And uh, I can show you in another case where we did a nice short fusion, but again, not restoring the lower arc. You can see the hyperlordosis in the upper spine, and uh, again, leading to a degeneration and revision. Uh, sometimes the patients are just too old and too unfit, and you only have to do what you can do. So uh, basically, I want you to create a balanced spine, decompress the regions that you need to, restore the lower arc of the lumbar lordosis, which is key, and then use osteotomies to fix your deformities when you need it. Thanks very much.